Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic. I'd like to invite you to a conference on artificial intelligence in cardiology and maybe give a brief overview of the kinds of topics that are creating a lot of excitement. Because one of the key questions is, can artificial intelligence substantially advance the field of medicine? And when you think about where ideas come from, I'd like to just take a minute to review that before we go into a specific example. This concept of where good ideas come from was nicely summarized by Stephen Johnson in his book. And he gives a story of a man who steps off of his boat, HMS Beagle. It's April 1836, and he wades out on the precipice of an underwater peak about to make the first great discovery of his career that would be the discovery of the century. And if you look at these images, you can begin to think about the sorts of observations he made. And if you look at the reef, it's filled with a large variety of different life forms that are synergistic and support each other and feed off of each other. And yet if you were to take 10,000 cubic feet of water from, say, a mile away, it might have almost no life. And if you look at the surface of the island, it would have no life. And of course, that man was Darwin, and he described evolution. But Johnson states that perhaps it's the same with ideas, that ideas feed off each other. And in many ways, we believe that to be true. And indeed, at our conference, we hope to have entrepreneurs, capitalists, physicians, providers, engineers, experts in AI to share ideas and cross-fertilize. And that's been a tradition of Mayo Clinic, where our core relief is the patient. We bring all sorts of specialties to bear. And we've added a new species, and that's the AI engineer who has joined us on rounds, has been with us with pacemaker implantations, ablation procedures, stress tests, echocardiograms. And through the process of the questions that come up, like, well, why do you do that? And you say, well, that's how I was trained to do it. But you start to think, well, why do we do things that way? We discover new insights. And I'll share an example with you now. Uh, over the next roughly 10 minutes. And that's this question of uh, identifying disease that's either subclinical, you don't know it's there, or that hasn't yet happened. Because if you think about our traditional paradigm, someone feels great, and then lightning strikes. They develop signs and symptoms, and only then do we start to order diagnostic tests and consider treatments. But sometimes that doesn't work. It can be too late. In cardiovascular medicine, the first event could be a stroke or a heart attack or sudden death. And yet we know that the physiologic and metabolic derangements that lead up to a coronary artery becoming narrowed or an arrhythmia developing may be going on for decades. And the signals are there, we just have to know how to read them and pick them up. Now one of the areas that we've decided to focus our attention on has been detecting concealed heart disease, or asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, which means the heart's main pump, the left ventricle, is weak, and the person may be unaware. And it's important because it affects 2% of the global population, more than 7 million Americans, up to 9% of people over the age of 60. And if you have a weak heart pump, then there are medications that over five professional society guidelines have uh, indicated prevent the development of symptoms and prolong life. There are implantable devices that can do the same. And yet, screening typically is done with an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of the heart, which is uh, widely available at tertiary care centers, but expensive. And you have to take off of work. And for more than half of Americans, you may have to drive more than an hour to get to a specialist who can perform the test. Same is true for a CT scan. Now, we know that every single heart cell, every myocyte, generates an electric voltage. And if you were to put an amplifier uh, connected to a microelectrode inside of a heart cell with a reference, the extracellular fluid, we would see a change in voltage associated with contraction of the heart muscle. That's how the heart signals and coordinates its contraction. And when you put together millions of heart cells in an actual heart and record the electrical signals at a distance from the body's surface, we get the electrocardiogram, or ECG, or EKG, it's the same. And the question is, if you looked at this ECG, could you determine whether or not a weak heart pump is available? And the short answer is, for nearly all clinicians, no. There's a lot of information we can get from looking at the electrical signals of the heart, but identifying a weak pump is not effectively done. 
We hypothesized, however, that a deep convolutional neural network could be trained to identify who has a low ejection fraction from the ECG. Or an ejection fraction means the amount of blood ejected with each heartbeat, or in other words, a weak heart pump. Now an ECG is painless, it's inexpensive, it's available everywhere, and it's massively scalable. So we have a very large data vault of uh, 500 hertz, 10 second ECG uh, samples that have been stored on millions of people. Everyone who's seen at Mayo Clinic is asked a question, and has been for decades, can we use your data for research in an anonymized manner? So this is all done with people's consent. And what we did was we took um, hundreds of thousands of ECG and echocardiogram pairs and used it to train a network. Now, many of you know um, quite well what a neural network is and how it works, but briefly, for those who don't, essentially it learns from the data itself. The data trains the network. In some ways, it's been uh, described analogous to the way a child may learn. You hold up a round fruit. Is this an apple or is it an orange? Well, uh, by repeated demonstrations, a child learns if it has a stem. If it's firm, it's likely to be an apple. If it's orange, pitted, it's more likely to be an orange. So similarly, we showed our network hundreds of thousands of ECGs and said this one has an ejection fraction or heart pump strength of 35%, this next one 55%. And after tens of thousands of examples, we fed in an ECG and said, what do you think it is? Is there a weak heart pump? And here's what we found. We found that um, the uh, function of the test was excellent. The tests are measured with a receiver operator characteristic. The area under the curve is a measure for how good a test is. A perfect test would be a 1.0. If it says you have a disease, you have it. If it says you don't have a disease, you don't. Filiping a coin is 0.5. And to give you a sense for it, a mammogram for breast cancer is 0.85. Um, a pap smear is 0.7. This test, the computer's ability to identify the presence of a weak heart pump was 0.93. So a very powerful medical test. Here's what was more striking. If the ECG indicates you have a weak heart pump, you then get an echocardiogram and it says, no, it's normal. We'd call that a false positive. If you follow people with false positives, for five years, they have a roughly fourfold increased risk of developing a weak heart pump. It's as if the tests were looking into the future. But we know, of course, that that's not the case. The test is detecting electrical abnormalities, and it appears that in many instances, the heart cells, the myocytes, are affected such that they don't develop a normal electrical signal before they become so affected by a disease process that they're unable to pump blood effectively. So this is important. What's interesting uh, is that we then said, well, maybe if we also told the network the age and the gender of the person whose ECG it's looking at, additional information, which affects heart disease, it could be better. And here's what was really striking. It wasn't. So then we thought, maybe the network, from reading an ECG, already knows whether you're a man or a woman and how old you are. So we turned the network around and asked it that question, and here's what we found. Look at this curve for gender. The area under the curve is 0.97. It's an almost perfect test. What that means is from an ECG, this network can tell your gender better than most people can walking down the street looking at somebody. And the age was um, measured, but within a few years there was some variation, and we, we thought maybe there's an interesting story there as well. Maybe. The ECG age is your physiologic age as opposed to your chronologic age. And we're still exploring this, but we notice that for some individuals there's an aging factor greater than one. That is, for each passing year of real time, your ECG goes up, ECG age goes up by more than a year. Some, and when we looked at charts, these tended to be people who lived healthy lives, uh, took care to exercise, um, actually age more slowly than time. And then we encountered this very interesting case a man who at age 38 looked like he was 50. By the time he was in his early 50s, he was almost 70 by ECG age, and then he got younger. You think, what could happen to make you lose so many years all at once? Turns out he got a heart transplant. This highlights just the power of this test and what it may be reading in terms of physiologic age. And in this case, he received a much younger heart. Um, these tools are massively scalable. 
We've partnered with a company that puts electrodes on a stethoscope and that will allow any caregiver to essentially have an expert cardiologist in their pocket to develop the, uh, to detect the presence of a weak heart pump. Um, similarly, we've partnered with a company that can link it to a smartphone so that people at home could uh, potentially use this form of test to see whether or not uh, there's a weak heart pump or their doctors could see if the medications they're giving them make the heart pump stronger or weaker. Now, I've highlighted some of the potential uses. All of these need to be proven and validated. A new test uh, is very exciting in the potential it can do to improve health, but without uh, confirming it in a medical practice, and that's currently steps that we're engaged in doing, we don't know for certain that it will improve outcomes the way we want it to. So that validation is necessary. So in summary, if you have interest in the roles of artificial intelligence in medicine, and particularly in cardiovascular medicine, uh, uh, in our program, we'll have experts in AI, experts in medicine, experts in creating startup companies to bring these tools to patients to help people, and we hope to see you there.